Well, you know what I titled my message today? Super moms. Hallelujah. Super moms. All moms are super. I guess we could say the most super, super mom would probably be Mary, you know, the mother of Jesus. If it wasn't for that mom, we wouldn't have a Lord and Savior. Lord, I'm sure God would have found somebody else, but he found this little virgin woman that said, Be it unto me according to your word. And we ought to praise and thank God for that every day. Amen. Hallelujah. The most super mom, Mary, mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. God had to find a really super mom. You know, mo mothers may be the most powerful influence on the face of the earth with the exception of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Boy, I got, I would have had a lot of amens from my moms out there. You see, motherhood is the anchor that holds the home. Amen. And uh, I got something here I'm going to read. It's, gonna, it's sort of long, but I thought it was good. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't this, this lady was a newspaper columnist, writer for years. Uh, I didn't. I didn't read her columns because she's a woman. <laughs> but I got this one. I read it. <laughs> Irma Brumbeck. Brumbeck. How many lady, How many here ever heard of that woman? Now see, you got to be pretty old. She's probably in heaven now. I hadn't heard of, her, heard of her for years. I don't know. She may be in heaven now. Praise God. But she had quite an imagination, and I just thought this was real good. Uh, she, she, she said this in one of her columns. She says, On the day God created mothers, he had already worked long overtime. An angel said to him, Lord, you sure are spending a lot of time on this one. The Lord turned and said, Have you read the specs in, on this model? She is supposed to be completely washable, but not plastic. She is to have 180 moving parts, all of them replaceable. She is to have a kiss that will heal everything from a broken leg to a broken heart. She is to have a lap that will disappear when she stands up. She is to be able to function on black coffee and leftovers. And she's supposed to have six pairs of hands. The angel said, six pairs of hands, that's impossible. It's not the six packs of hands that bother me, said the Lord. It's the three pairs of eyes. She is supposed to have one pair that sees through closed doors so that whatever, she is, uh, whatever uh, she's supposed to know, what are you kids doing there? She already knows but what, they're doing, what they're doing in there. She has another pair in the back of her head to see all the things she's not supposed to see but must see. And she has one pair right in front that can look at a child who goofed and communicate love and understanding without saying a word. That's too much, said the angel. You can't put that much in one mode. Why don't you rest for a while and resume your creating tomorrow? No, I can't, said the Lord. I'm close to creating someone very much like myself. I've already come up with a model who can heal herself when she's sick, who can feed a family of six with one pound of hamburger, and who can persu pers persuade a nine-year-old to take a shower. <laughs> then the angel looked at the model of motherhood very closely and said, she's too soft. Oh, but she's tough, said the Lord. You'll be surprised how much this mother can do. Uh, can she think, asked the angel. Not only can she think, said the Lord, but she can reason and compromise and persuade. Then the angel reached over and touched her cheek. And he said, this one has a leak. That's not a, that's, that's, that's not a leak, said the Lord. That's a tear. What's a tear for us, asked the angel. Well, it's for joy, for sadness, for sorrow, for disappointment, for pride. You're a geni genius, said the Lord, angel. Well, he already know that. And the Lord said, oh, but I didn't put it there. In other words, he didn't put the tear there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, that's a super mom. That's super moms. Amen. Hallelujah. 
You know, there's been a war against motherhood in America. A war of murdering babies in the womb. A spiritual war against the, uh, you know, we're in a spiritual war, folks, against the devil and his host who comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, Satan, he's the great deceiver. He deceives so many people. And he can deceive us if we're not careful. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on the Word of God. And he'll not be able to deceive us. Now, God forgives women who've had abortions. God will even forgive those who do the abortions. Amen. You know, uh, Jesus, you know, on the cross when they were dividing his clothes, hanging there on the cross as they crucified him. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not, not what they do. And this is what we're dealing with. They don't know what they're doing. They're deceived. But we need to stand up. We need to stand up for life. We need to stand up for truth. Amen. Amen. We're the church of the living God. And even Stephen, you know, when they were stoning Stephen, he said, Lord, don't, don't char change them with this sin. Now, I missed one scripture in the very beginning now, I was going to share with you. So in Genesis 3, verse 20, it says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Well, she was a pretty super mom too, wasn't she? It says she was the mother. Why would she be the mo mother of all living? Well, if she wasn't a mother, there wouldn't be any other mothers. Amen. So uh, we can, you know, we can trace the mothers all the way back to Eve. <coughs> Hallelujah. But getting back to this abortion thing, you know, I'm sure if you, if you keep up with the news anyway, I watch Victory News myself. It comes on twice a day. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's looking at the news in faith. Amen. And uh, we know there was a great leak in the Supreme Court concerning abortion we got we have five justices who are voting to do away with road versus wade now it won't do away with abortion but what it does it does away with that law road versus wade and it sends this the, it sends abortion back to the states and really the church I, i'm telling you church our fight is only beginning because we got to pray that these churches will, these states will wake up, and the churches in these states will wake up, and take a stand for life. Amen. And I tell you, I we, I want us to pray for these five justices. I'm gonna put their names up here, uh, on the board. And why would I say pray? These are the five that voted to do away with Roe versus Wade and send it back to the states. Now it hadn't come out yet. See, it was a leak. Why would somebody leak it before they actually brought it forth as a solid decision? Because they want, to, they want people to come against these justices. They want, they, want to, they want to cause all the pain they possibly can to get one of them to change their minds. So here they are. Samuel, Alito, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gosheff. Brett Kavanaugh, Amy Corny Barnett, Barrett, Barnett, Barrett. I hope you write those names down. You need to be praying. Church, the church needs to be praying for these judges because they're, going, they're being so intimidated. They're, uh, they're, their lives are being threatened. Their family lives are being threatened because it leaked out that they've made this decision right here and this will be coming out. It probably won't come out until after these midterm elections, but that it's, it's coming out. We want to stand and make sure. I'm even praying there's one more of those other justices is going to come over with them. We've got to stand for life. And if, and if we don't, we'll never get rid of this curse that's come upon America. Abortion. Hallelujah. Well, let's get back to super moms. Amen. You know, the head of the home is the father. That's what the Bible says. 
but the heart of the home is the mother. Now we joke, you know, and say, well, yeah, I'm the head, but she's, 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 the, she's the neck. You know, the neck turns the head. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's times I'm glad that my neck turned my head. You know, sometimes, men, we need our head turned. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, occasionally, you know, not every day. <laughs> Just when we need, when we need some extra wisdom. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I, this is one problem we got in America. The men need to come forth and stand and be the heads of their homes. Amen. And love and love their wives like Jesus loves the church. Hallelujah. Today we're going to look at the life of a mother named Hannah. How many has ever heard of Hannah? Most of us. Her name means gracious. And she didn't have a very easy life. Polygamy was tolerated in her day. Y'all know what that means. Her husband had more than one wife. I don't know how in the world they would handle more than one wife, but they, that was, that was allowed for some reason, and I don't question God, but it ain't to be allowed no more. Amen. Hannah was barren and was mocked, she was scorned, she was ridiculed by her husband's other wife because of the fact that she was barren. And she cried out to God that she might have a baby. Now we're going to read all about this over in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 10 through 28 there as we go on through this. She wanted a baby that she could raise for God and give, then give back to God. She wanted a baby that she could give back to God. And uh, I think she's a picture of a great super mother. And there's five principles for raising godly kids. And this would apply to fathers and anyone who desires to be something for God, these five principles. And the first principle is the principle of priority. The principle of priority. I want us to look at the scripture in 1 John 1, verse 10 and 11. It says, And she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed to the Lord, and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant, and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child. See, she got, a, she got re very specific here. She had a real priority here. She wanted a male child that she could give back to the Lord. She says, Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. She had her priorities right. And we all need to keep our priorities right. Let me tell you what the, the Bible tells, uh, as a matter of fact, our Lord himself said this. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. That so much of the world is seeking after. He says, all these things will be added to you. If you put him first, his kingdom first, his righteousness first. You know, that's what we do when we bring the tithe and offerings into the storehouse. We're saying, God, you're my source. You're my source. I put you first. I seek you first. I seek your righteousness. And hey, all the things he'll add to you. Hallelujah. He's already given us all things, really. All we got to do is get his, get his principles working in our life and, and receive them. Hallelujah. So her desire, the desire of her heart was to have a child, a male child. And she prayed earnestly. She had a God-given instinct, a desire placed, placed in her heart by 
for Almighty God to have a child. You know, I think it's what uh, uh, Psalms 37, 4, somewhere like that says, Delight thyself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You know what that, the word delight means? It means to be pliable. Understand that he's, we're the clay, he's the potter. He's, so Lord, we, we want to be pliable. We want you to mold us the way you want us molded. The way our lives are supposed to be. Hallelujah. Delight thyself in the Lord. He says, I'll give you the desires of your heart. In other words, he's going to place his de desires in us. That's what he did with Hannah here. She had a God-given instinct, a desire placed in her heart by Almighty God to have a child. Psalm 127.3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Amen. Psalm 128.3 and 4 says, Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Boy, that's what we need. That's what we need in the church. That's what we need in our homes today. We need, we need the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. There's something wrong in America when little children are looked upon as burdens rather than blessings. There's something drastically wrong when little babies are put to death in the mother's womb. And when would-be parents choose the world's wealth over having a child. See, children do not make rich people poor. Children make poor people rich. Amen. And Hannah did not think it was less than the best to be a mother. She wanted a child so desperately. And this brings us to the pr next principle here, the principle of prayer. Verse 10 there says, and she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. See, when we have our priorities in order, our prayer lives will line up behind those priorities. You know, you need, if, you, if you're wanting children, you need to begin to pray for your children before they're born. Even before they're conceived, pray for them. And certainly pray for them after they're born. Understand that children should come, we should look at children as an answer to prayer. Amen. You know, there are several women in Scripture who were barren. But God's grace, thank God for His grace. He gave each of these, uh, he gave each of these a child who blessed and changed the world. Let me just mention a few of them here. Sarah, the wife of Abraham. She was barren, listen to this, she was barren until she was 90 years of age. Sarah had Isaac. Ruth, remember Ruth? Ruth was barren and God gave her Obed. That, he, was the grand, he was the grandfather of King David from whom the line, the Messiah, would come through. Elizabeth, over in the New Testament, the cousin of Mary, Elizabeth was barren, and God answered her prayer and gave her John the Baptist. And John was the forerunner of Jesus. And God gave to Hannah a baby boy named Samuel. You know, did you know Samuel was the greatest individual in the Old Testament between Moses and King David? Between Moses and King David, he is the greatest individual in the Old Testament. And God gave Samuel to Hannah because she prayed and she asked for a child that she could give back to him. And we have such a tragedy today 
unwanted children. They shouldn't be any unwanted children. They shouldn't be people killing their babies in the womb. Pray for them. They're deceived. But God forgives them. He will forgive them when they turn to Him, just like He, he will forgive any, any sinner that turns to Him. Amen. What would the world be like without Isaac? What would the world be like without Joseph or John the Baptist? What would the world be like without Samuel? What would the world be like without Jesus? We wouldn't be here. There'd be no salt of the earth. There'd be no light in the world. Principle number three is the principle of purpose. The principle of purpose. God has a purpose for every life. 1 Samuel 11, the last part of that verse says, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Now, no razor shall come upon his head meant that Hannah would give her son to be a Nazarite. And Nazarites were a special group of people who had been given to God in a special way. You can read about that in Numbers chapter 6, verse 5. So in effect, Hannah was saying that she wanted a holy child, a child separated unto the Lord. That's what a Nazarite was, separated unto the Lord from birth. If the child has come from God and is a gift from God, then the child must give it, be given back to God. You know, we, we need to give our children in faith, give our children to God for His will and purpose to be accomplished in each one of them's lives. Hannah's prayer must have been in the will of God because God heard her prayer and answered her prayer. And if you pray and ask God for a child, then your prayers must follow that child and you must have a purpose in your heart for that child. Many prayers seem to go unanswered because of what? what? Twisted priorities. 3 John 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. It's God speaking through the Apostle John. I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. And 1 John 5, 4 says, Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And of course it goes on to say, if He hears us, then we'll have the petition that we've asked. But why? Because we pray according to the will of God. We have to learn to pray according to God's Word. According to His Word. And I'm not saying you should pray that your child should be rich or successful, but pray Scripture over your child. and He will be rich and He will be successful. We know we're praying in the will of God when we pray from the Word of God. Amen. From the Word of God. Hannah had a purpose for her son, a child to, to, to serve the Lord. You know, we can't make our children serve the Lord. We can have goals for ourselves, and we can have desires for our children. And of course, our desire should be for godly children, and our goal should be that we be godly parents. Godly parents. Now, I want us to look at this fourth principle, and as we look at this, we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to read quite a bit of scripture here. First Samuel 1: 12 through 20. This is the principle of persistence. Oh, Hannah was so persistent in her prayer life. So persistent to see this desire to have this child come forth. 
verse 12. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. You know, they thought they was drunk on the day of Pentecost. And they were. They were drunk in the Holy Ghost. New wine, yeah, new wine. And you can get drunk today and on new wine. And there'll be no hangovers. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. He was a glutton, you know. He got so fat he fell over dead. <laughs> but Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. She was probably drunk on the Holy Ghost. Do not consider your maid servant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maid servant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Verse 19. Then they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and, return, and, and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah, that's, his, that's her husband, knew Hannah his wife and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that H Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This woman was so persistent. Not only did she pray for Samuel before he was born, she continued to pray for him after he was born in those dark days. And you know, no, no matter how dark and how difficult and desolate the days may be, we need to pray and keep on praying. And stand. And when we've done all still, stand against the forces of evil. Isaiah 40, 31. I, I, I confess this scripture every day. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. When you get my age, you need this prayer. <laughs> well, you need it all the time. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. I don't run that much, but I, I, I don't faint when I walk. <laughs> Hallelujah. Delight thyself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. That's Psalm 37, 4. Ephesians 6, 8 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Glory to God. Because of Hannah's perseverance, her sorrow was turned to gladness. You know, the name Samuel means asked of the Lord. That's what the name means, asked of the Lord. He's here because I asked the Lord for him. Hallelujah. Now, if you really want to read about Hannah's prayer life after her son was born, read chapter 2 there. We won't read it this morning. And this brings us to the fifth principle, the principle of persuasion. And we're going to read now uh, verse 21 through 28. Now the man, Elkanah, her husband, 
And all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will take him, that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So Elkada, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Then when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls, one ephraim of flour and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore I also have lent, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. I guess that means she loaned him. To the Lord as long as he lived he was the Lord's so they worship the Lord there the principle of persuasion is what we're talking about once you pray with all your heart get your priorities right get your prayer right get your purpose right get your persistence persistence right then you begin to do what what you alone can do to persuade that child for Jesus, to accept Jesus. We must do everything we can with our children when they're young to teach them about Jesus. You know, that's one of the things about the church. The church is not just a place where we come and wor worship God. It's a place where, uh, it, it's a place where the five-fold ministry and and, and Throughout the church, you know, we, 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 we're to teach, we're to train, we're to disciple people to what? Be ministers of the Lord. Did you know you, your greatest minister, should begin when you leave the doors of this church every Sunday? Yes, there'll be places of ministry for some in the church. But, you know, all believers are ministers according to the Word of God. We're all to be ministers, and it's a five-fold ministry is to equip to equip believers to be ministers. And, and I don't know why everybody thinks, well, if I'm going to be a minister, I've got to be behind a pulpit. No, your ministry begins when you walk out these doors. We're to go into the world out there. We're to go into these seven mountains of influence in the world and minister for God. On your job, in your businesses. In your shopping. We all do a lot of that. In your shopping. Hallelujah. And we must begin to persuade our children when they're young to accept Jesus. Hannah was a wise woman to have such a priority to make sacrifices and to bring Samuel to the house of the Lord. Now, we have, a, we have a New Testament example of a godly woman who exhibited persuasion in her children. And this was Timothy's mother and grandmother. We're told this over in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. When I call to remember the genuine faith that is in you, this is Paul speaking to young Timothy which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. That's a perfect example of a godly woman and grandma, a mother and grandmother that taught Timothy to receive Jesus and let Jesus be Lord of his life. 
You know, a father has, can have much influence on a child. But the deepest impression is made by mother. That means fathers need to step up to the plate and be more influential to their children in this hour we're living in. But the deepest impression is always made by that mother. And there's nothing greater than to raise a child for Jesus Christ. Nothing greater. And we need to never underestimate the power of a mother. A super mom. And in conclusion, we need to say this. All children need the father and they need acceptance. They need belonging. They need to feel belong. And they didn't need confidence. And I tell you, when you teach them Jesus and the Word of God, they cannot, they'll have all these three things. And to be a godly mother or parent, you first must be surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus. So I want to just have every head bowed and every eye closed here today.